history in housing segregation and as a result uh, disproportionate wealth within the region uh, within the area and disproportionate funding for schools as a result um, so growing up there and seeing sort of the disparities between the high schools that I attended the ones that were around me and even like at very close distances like uh, within like a two-minute drive it's an entirely different school district um, and so that's sort of what led to my interest in education policy and who makes these decisions on how schools are funded, how they're managed. Um, and so I got my bachelor's in economics from Northeastern where I focused on education policy and had a minor in data science, which um, led me to some more quantitative interest in how to approach um, studying education. Um, and most recently I, I worked in um, a pre-doc program at uh, Brown University's Annenberg for Institute for School Reform, um, where I supported Providence Public Schools in different research and analysis questions that they've had over the last um, more so semester. Um, and this is particularly relevant because Providence in Rhode Island was just taken over by the state, um, and that leads to sort of different questions on, you know, is this effective for the state to be taking over a local school district, and what are the impacts of moving decision power away from a local community to the hands of the state? Um, and in some cases, it's necessary because of extreme inequality that exists in mismanagement, but also how do you uh, balance that with local input and making sure that communities still feel heard and addressed, uh, their issues addressed in how the state operates the school district. Um, and a bit about my research partner here, I'm working with Centro Justicia Educacional um, at the Católica. Um, they are predominantly sociologists who work in different lines of research, um, some on um, uh, curriculum and pe um, pedagogy, some on uh, issues of students between um, disparities in, between students with disabilities and students without disabilities, and I'm working with the line of research that deals with institutional uh, disparities, um, so looking at the structures that exist around education, how it's funded, how it's managed. Um, and so the main objectives of the organization are to train new researchers interested in educational justice and different methods. Um, and I'm really excited about that because I haven't worked with sociologists and I'm excited to sort of implement mixed methods into um, the way that I'm learning about um, uh, educational governance. Um, and they also do a lot of analysis on different education policies, mostly at the national level, um, as well as some improvement analysis and they work with different partners at the national and international levels. Um, so a lot of different input on sort of methods of research as well as the topics of choice. Um, and they're going to be working um, in the next few months on uh, assessing early impacts of the Servicios Locales de Educación, which are, um, I'll get into the definition of them, but these macro districts that come from uh, municipalities have additionally additional oversight over the districts because there really isn't what we have in the United States where most of funding and most of accountability systems exist at the state level. Um, here it's really just at the national level and at the municipality level and that can lead to inequalities that sort of are just not um, well observed or reported in data um, as well as just from general oversight not having additional people just making sure that students are being provided for. Um, but that's also a bit political. Some people don't agree that the additional bureaucracy is necessary, which is what leads me to this um, research interest to see whether or not there's actual impacts of this new level of educational governance. Um, and so some of these definitions are um, pretty universal to like public administration. They're not specific to education, but the first is just centralization, so the moving of power from uh, different authorities into a single authority, so you can think of um, any powers going from the state to the national level or from municipalities to a regional or state level. Um, and then what happened here in Chile, uh, 
after the Pinochet dictatorship was the opposite of that, so decentralization, moving from the national to the municipality level. Um, and this has been heavily critiqued because it was seen as sort of a reduction in the national government's um, involvement in education provision. And when you combine that with the privatization of education in Chile, there's a lot of sort of contention as to what exactly should be done by the national government and who should be responsible for ensuring that students are being provided for. Um, and so as a result of this, the Servicios Locales de Educación were formed, and they're still sort of forming. It's a gradual process that should be done by 2025, which I'll get into how that makes this challenging. Um, but 70 regional macro districts comprise from 304 municipalities. Um, and so one thing that I want to be studying is essentially like what exactly are the responsibilities that these 70 macro districts now have that were moved from municipality level, and what exactly does that change on the ground for teachers? Um, and then another interest that I have that is related to all of this, but um, not as attached, um, is funding equalization. So it's this concept of making sure that students are provided for, uh, in terms of resource allocation equitably and not just equally, so not providing the same amount per student, but based on different needs, both at the student level and at the community level. Um, so in the US, a big group is students with special needs, um, special education, uh, courses, as well as students who are English language learners just because of the additional time that these students need and typically like ideally smaller classroom sizes and the additional cost that that puts on districts. It could also be uh, differences in property values in the United States, so because so much of education funding comes from local governments, the differences in property values can exasperate the inequalities within schools. Um, so part of funding equalization is to take that into account as states distribute funding to uh, different uh, districts. Um, and so a bit on why Chile and the United States and why they're sort of comparable and why it would be interesting to compare the two. Um, so while they have obviously very different histories, um, there are similar challenges in social, political, and economic inequality that I think have been pretty highlighted in the last 10, 15 years, especially in Chile. There's a lot of um, movements from students especially to uh, get more funding for higher education for a K through 12 equivalent. Um, and so those similar uh, challenges exist in the US, maybe focused differently. Like I know that the topic of student loan debt and the impact that that has on uh, the economy right now and younger uh, graduates is a big challenge in the United States. I don't think it has as much of a political movement as it does in Chile, but nonetheless similar. Um, and in terms of high performance and or high improvements, so Chile um, is part of the OECD, meaning it's uh, typically like a more industrialized country, and within that group it performs below um, mean PISA scores. So these are these uh, international tests that are taken, I believe, at third and eighth grade to assess sort of where different countries are relative to each other. But um, while it does perform below the average, it has one of the highest improvement rates over time aren't shown here, um, and the United States uh, performs slightly above the mean, so I clocked this so that you could kind of see the names, but um, the average is about 504 for reading and like around the same for mathematics and science, um, and the U.S. does uh, a bit better than average, but both countries' scores are way significantly down because of how high inequality is across different measures um, and so I'm really interested in understanding sort of why this exists and um, what is being done at a structural level to change it um, and so both countries have um, similar but slightly different um, lenses that are uh, used to assess inequality so in the, in the US we hear a lot of uh, differences in race and socioeconomic groups and that does exist in Chile as well but even at a higher level, the differences between geographic groups is important. Um, and so in the literature in the US, uh, there does seem to be a gap in terms of exploring the uh, policies around rural student education. And I think that having a bit more context um, through looking at research in Chile will help me sort of navigate that. Um, as someone who isn't from a rural area, I'm still really interested in sort of exploring um, the differences in the politics and the policies that exist to provide for those students in different regions. Um, in addition to the differences and similarities in the types of inequality, um, there's also different debates and similar debates in terms of 
privatization and local autonomy in public administration and for this specifically in education. Um, so I know that even, uh, so last year, or uh, two years ago, I don't know if you guys heard of like, the debates about vouchers and um, having essentially the public, public funds go to provide for students who may want to go to private schools in the US. So that system already exists in Chile. Um, and it's interesting to sort of see the politics around that and sort of the history of how that came to be. Um, predominantly because a lot of public education in Chile used to be done by the Catholic Church, and so a lot of the schools that exist and the schools that have uh, quality resources tend to be private schools. Um, and in the US, sort of um, in terms of like by political groups, the Republicans are really pushing these vouchers, but Democrats are also trying to uh, introduce some sort of market-based um, competition within education through charter schools. Um, so it's not necessarily just a, a partisan issue, it's sort of uh, wanting to introduce some competition between schools in order to increase the quality, but also understanding that this has limitations on uh, the role that communities can play in education, as well as understanding the disparities that exist between students who have access to things like charter schools, things like private schools and vouchers, um, and understanding how, what makes sense in terms of accountability of those schools. Because um, there can also be differences in terms of testing and what exactly um, the districts have to assess as they're operating these different types of schools. Um, and so the questions that I have for this research project um, there are quite a few. I'm still working with my research partner to um, get something more specific and concrete, and some of these questions also feed into each other. Um, but my first question is, what policies both in Chile and the United States have changed structures of educational finance and accountability systems? Um, so looking specifically at the language in the policies and sort of understanding at what level they come. Most of them are at the national government, but in the US especially, there's a lot of differences between states. Um, and then my second question that I'm excited to work with because um, SJE, the research partner that I'm working with, is also planning to work on this, um, is how the SLE uh, system has impacted the responsibilities between schools, municipalities, and the national government. And essentially trying to figure out, is it worth it to create these macro districts and to change sort of the systems that have already been in place. Um, and then I'm really interested as well as like how this changes, what's on the ground, what students are seeing, how this impacts like the daily uh, careers of teachers, um, and how that connects to sort of the different accountability systems that exist because more accountability, more sort of surveillance of what teachers are doing and um, making sure that data is collected is also a big part or like contention in education sort of at what level should we be teaching to make sure that there's data about what we're teaching versus providing for these students through different curriculum that could be um, could better serve them in the long term. Um, and so those are the main questions that I have. Um, and so my proposed timeline for this, um, it's a bit all over the place because I think there's a few questions that I have that don't necessarily um, connect in the same type of research, but the first thing that I want to do is contextualize government responsibilities in both countries and conduct some interview with different stakeholders about their perception of um, the changes in Chile specifically. Um, and then I want to analyze educational spending and accountability trends and policies, so understanding those um, different policies that were, have been enacted to change how both educational spending and accountability um, is done at the national and then municipal levels. And then I want to look at qualitative analysis of funding equalization functions, both in the US and Chile. So uh, these funding equalizations like tend to be formulas that you could like plug in different um, factors, both at the student and school level, to see how much a school would get, both from the state and the national government in the US. And in Chile, it's predominantly the national government. Um, and then to get more at that question of, you know, what is the role of the Servicio Local de Educación conducting some interviews with edu educators and professionals within the agencies to understand their perception of it. Um, and the reason I want to do this towards the end is just because uh, the Servicio Local de Educación are pretty new. Um, and they're still, because of the pandemic and because of um, different challenges, um, their rollout has been pretty slow. Um, and so then in the last few months, just consolidating the findings and writing up a policy sort of brief on these different um, uh, policies that are both in the US and in Chile. 
Um, and so I kind of got into this throughout, but um, some of the possible challenges is that because of the delayed execution, partially because of politics and partially because of the pandemic, there's limited amounts of time that have been, uh, has, that has passed to really create an analysis that's like, you know, uh, by time. So like what happened before, what happens now. Um, so I'm going to work with the research partner that I have to figure out what methods work for this um, and sort of what capacity and limitations there are to really create some sort of like more causal research. Um, and because of the gradual adoption of the region, I, of the in the regions of this policy, it's also hard to really create concrete um, uh, analysis that is a, like a before and after effect. Um, and lastly, that the quantitative analysis portion, so understanding the different um, funding formulas in their relationship to performance, for example, might be limited just because of the pandemic's limitations on student testing and sort of the priorities of the school districts during this like insane time. Um, and so, yeah, I think that um, I'll be able to work through these with um, the research partners at uh, Centro Educacional. Um, and I'm excited to sort of figure out sort of like what they're doing in terms of assessing policies and um, writing up, uh, losing my track of thought, um, writing up suggestions and recommendations for the government agencies. Um, that's all I have, yeah. Thank you so much.